Well, I'm very pleased to introduce our guest, who I've known for a number of years because we have similar fields and interests in uh, Russian-American relations in the 19th century. Uh, Ivan is a native of Volgograd. Uh, he is the director of the Department of International Relations and Area Studies at uh, the university there. Uh, he defended his doctorate uh, in the Institute of World History at the Russian Academy of Sciences in 2005. Uh, as I mentioned, his major research interest is Russian-American relations, primarily 19th century. His teaching is primarily in American history uh, at uh, in Volgograd. Uh, he's also interested in the development of civil society in Russia and the politics of history, and has published several books. The one that I've been most interested in, well, two actually, uh, a biography of Daniel Webster, and uh, a very good book on the uh, history of Russian-American relations, 1830, 19, 1850. Uh, it's called Trans-Oceanic Partners. <laughs> 18. So, 1850s, I mean, 18, 18, okay. and, and on that note, I just learned a little trivia, <laughs> that the minister during that period of, of Russia to the United States, who lived in Georgetown, in a big mansion, his name was Bodisco, that mansion is now occupied by the current Secretary of State, John Kerry. <laughs> uh, Anyway, he will be going to Abilene, and we just also learned this morning that uh, that has been widely publicized in the Kansas and world press by the Eisenhower Library, and he will be talking about the memorialization of the Battle of Stalingrad. So, and of course, that battle has made Volgograd famous. Uh, it could be called, arguably, uh, the biggest battle of the greatest war. So. Uh, that'll be uh, interesting. I'm looking forward to hearing his talk. I've, I've been fortunate to be able to see him in Volgograd and have a tour of many of the sites uh, in the city. Uh, this was for a conference that he organized in uh, about 18 months ago in uh, Volgograd on the title was Russia and the American Civil War, another great war. And, <laughs> And it was a very interesting conference, and I very much enjoyed being there. He is also the editor of a journal which is published in Volgograd called Americana. I will circulate this around. Uh, this contains the proceedings of that conference uh, on Russia and the American Civil War. Uh, uh, I mentioned that this is a memorialization talk. His talk today is on the use and misuse of history in Russia. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, let me thank uh, Kansas University and personally Dr. Saul and uh, Dr. Redford who invited me here and uh, gave me this uh, good opportunity to, to meet you and to, to share some of my recent research. And uh, I would also say that this research is partially uh, his historian's research and partially it's probably political science because the use of history is mostly, uh, well, I, I'm a historian, so I'm trying to, I, I was trying to judge about all of this from the point of view of a professional historian, how we can survive this politic politicization of, of history, historic history. Because, uh, well, there are, there are politicians who are using history, but they, well, they, we, we have a very difficult relationship between the professional <laughs> field and, and those who are trying to interfere into our domain. And this is a, actually the uh, core of my of my one of my current projects research. Uh, but uh, I will tell you uh, I will tell you some uh, history, some some short short story of how how this uh, history use of history was changing during the last. Uh, decade, but uh, I will start uh, briefly with the perestroika. Before perestroika, uh, well, I will. Uh, what I'm uh, talking is mostly the kind of official narrative, something which we have in the uh, textbooks, especially in school textbooks, uh, something which uh, we have uh, memor memorialized all this 
monuments uh, in the streets of the cities, uh, the names of actually of the streets in the cities and in some uh, instances. All of that uh, needs to provide some uh, well, hegemonic, I would say, a version of the historical narrative, something which is uh, important to socialize uh, the people, to, 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 to let them think about history in their common terms. And for, for Russia, history is a major tool of so, so socializing, as a major tool uh, compared here in America is probably compared to like political uh, attitude to liberty and, uh, or, uh, and the values of, of democratic society. Uh, for for Germany, probably now economy is a major uh, source of national pride. But for Russians, history was always been the source of national pride, something that unite the nation and make the nation feel uh, well share the common values. And uh, if you uh, go back to Perestroika epoch, that was a period when uh, most of the previous narrative was destroyed. It was destroyed for good because it included uh, also uh, that uh, previous narrative was mostly coined during the Stalin epoch. It was uh, so-called short course of the history of Communist Party, the major textbook which uh, it contained the, uh, all the official uh, interpretations of the not only of, of the history of Russia, but the world history in general. And that was a base for all of the variants of uh, school textbooks, for the teaching in, in high school and, and even the universities to some extent. But uh, that was, uh, that needed to be destroyed. It needed to be destroyed because uh, during the Perestroika, uh, many of the uh, previously closed archives were open and many of the previously oppressed uh, memories uh, of, of uh, what prisoners of those who suffered under Stalin regime was opened or publicized, and people cannot just live, live along, the, live, uh, continue to live with that old kind of a narrative. And I remember uh, I was I graduated from my university in 1991, and exactly the day, uh, the year when the uh, Soviet Union collapsed, and that was also the year when. Uh, in Russian t schools, in Russian high schools, the history were studied by the translation of a French writer, Nikola Vert, uh, instead of, because there is no, well, the old Soviet textbooks were obsolete by that time, but there is no, no new book existed, so the, transla the translation of Nikola Vert, History of Soviet Union, was a major, uh, well, ma major textbook for, for a couple of years in Russian schools, before some, something new appeared. And that was, of course, a very revolutionary time in this, uh, from this point of view. Uh, but uh, the problem was that during the 90s, uh, no new narrative appeared. And by the end of the decade, and, well, the government by Yeltsin and, uh, well, that first reformist government was probably pre preoccupied by economic issues and all, all the other kind of, kind of problems that Russia uh, faced back in the 1990s. And, uh, well, the, the symbolic, uh, the importance of, of symbolic universe, the symb importance of uh, narrative was just probably get out of sight of, of that time government. And uh, by the end of the decade, uh, there was a, some kind of um, social request, social demand, social demand for the, some kind of, of a new overarching narrative. Well, not everybody shared the demand, but I think that uh, Vladimir Putin, who came to presidency just on the eve of the year 2000, uh, understood the importance of the symbolic universe much more than Yeltsin before him. And one of his first, actually one of his first visits was a visit to Volgograd, to my native city, mm -hmm. even in, in, in early February of year 2000, just one month and a half after he became the acting president. Mm -hmm. And since that time, he visited Volgograd very frequently, at least uh, once a every two years, and he visited it usually on the anniversaries of Stalingrad battle, because he understands that Volgograd, or Stalingrad, former Stalingrad, the city of the greatest battle, uh, has a very big symbolic importance for, for Russian people. And the Second World War has a pretty, pretty big uh, symbol, well, not a symbolic, but it's a, it's a pretty heavy uh, memory for every Russian family. And I don't know what to compare with in the, for, for Americans. Maybe civil war here, but uh, just imagine that you were living just one generation out of civil war. Some of the civil war survivors are still there, because this is something which which influenced uh, uh, Russian, uh, 
I think all Russian families, some of them, some of the relatives were killed during the war, and some suffered, and many, all suffered a lot. And, you know, out of the population of the Soviet Union, not only Russia, but all, all Soviet Union at the time of like, about 170 million by the beginning of the war, 27, according to the latest uh, estimates, 27 million were killed. You can imagine how big the sacrifice was, how, how large was the sacrifice during the Second World War. That, that in Russia is called Great, Great Patriotic War. And, uh, and this is an important thing. And, and Putin, from the very beginning of his presidency, wanted to connect somehow his personality to this war, remember, so forth. So during, uh, since the beginning of his presidency, the, well, the government uh, was trying to, recre to create a new historical narrative or we can say historical myth, which historical narrative which will uh, combine the society to make the society feel uh, feel proud of this of this past of, of its past and uh, and somehow also uh, portray Putin's and current regime as a uh, as a proud uh, successor of the all the victories of the Soviet Union. And the Great Patriotic War was important for two reasons. First, because it was a common suffering for all the Russian people. And the second one, because it was a common victory. It's the greatest victory that the generations uh, remember. Uh, and uh, that was was, was, was important. Uh, and uh, what were the tools that the state tried to uh, use? To coin this new narrative, this what uh, this narrative was well, from from afar. It looks like this is the same narrative we had in the Soviet Union under Brezhnev, at least, and, uh, because it also was very made very important stress on this importance of the Second World War. And the uh, Brezhnev time was also was full of the monument uh, construction of monument and memorialization of the Second World War. But there was a difference, of course. Uh, first of all, uh, during Soviet regime, until the, including Brezhnev, of course, and then including Gorbachev period, uh, the beginning and the major event was still the October Revolution of 1917. And the victory of the Second World War was the number two event. Now this uh, re memory of the October Revolution is faded away, and it was a lot of controversy about, this, uh, great, uh, about the Great October Socialist Revolution, as you used to call it. And of course, uh, there is no well, nobody tried to impose an official point of view of the October Revolution. There is a lot of arguments of, of any side. Some say that it was a still great revolution with some flaws, and some others say it was a like, foreign plot to German plot to, to, to let Russia out of the, second, of the First World War. Uh, and it, well, the, those arguments are free, and that nobody tried to interfere. But the Second World War, the Great Patriotic War, now is a core of the official narration, official uh, memory of, of, of the state, not only of the society, but of the state. And the state tries to hold uh, control over the interpretations of, this, of the Great Patriotic War, the Second World War. This is a uh, point where the state interferes very severely, I would say, and very, uh, very often. I just... Uh, uh, made several examples of, of the interference of the state in this narrative. Well, first of all, of course, is uh, uh, school textbooks. And school textbooks is for it. For the late, last decade is always in the center of the uh, attention by Putin, Medvedev, and all of the state officials. They want, they, uh, they are not happy with the, uh, with the textbooks and how they portray, especially Second World War. Uh, well. They change it already. I don't know what what, what, what else they need from the, the school textbooks, but they still uh, think that it's not not enough uh, not enough I think good uh, in descriptions of the Second World War. And uh, I will uh, tell several examples a little bit later. But uh, the second uh, this, well, th th there are some some particular instances when. Um, Several years ago, it was uh, I think it was late 2007. Uh, Don Cossacks wanted to rehabilitate their longtime leader during the uh, during the Russian Civil War, Ataman Krasnov, Ataman Peter Krasnov, 
and that was an attempt to rehabilitate him. Like, you know, we are now have more, uh, not black and white history, we have uh, figures who were leaders in the civil war, and we, by that time, actually, Russia officially recognized such a white movement leaders like Anton Denikin, and who was a, uh, one of the leaders of anti-Bolshevik uh, forces during the civil war. So why not recognize another anti-Bolshevik leader, Pyotr Krasnov, especially because Kozaks uh, feels he, he was their leader, he was a, a head of quasi, quasi independent Kozak Republic of the Don mm -hmm. in the, uh, 1918, 1919. And uh, after that claim was made that Petr Krasnov may be rehabilitated, uh, very soon uh, President Putin himself personally flew down to Rostov, this Kozak uh, capital, and he met Kozak leaders under the closed door for a whole day. And uh, I don't know what, the, well, exactly, there are no proceedings of that uh, meeting ever, was ever published, but the next day the Kozak leaders uh, revoke all of the attempts to, to rehabilitate Krasnov, and Krasnov was well, uh, somebody was punished, some press secretary was punished for, for mis misunderstanding uh, the idea. And, uh, and, they, uh, and why? Why all of that? Uh, because Pyotr Krasnov, during the Second World War, allied with Germany. And he was hanged as a war criminal in 1946. And that was to rehabilitate Krasnov, was uh, from the official point of view, is to interfere in the official narrative. And still, official, uh, official uh, Soviet narrative. Soviet, of course, post-Soviet narrative of the Second World War now uh, cannot uh, give any voice to Vlasovites, to all of the Russians who fought against Soviet Union. It was a pretty big uh, gr uh, group of Soviet people who fought against. So some estimates even up to a million, I don't know, maybe it's an exaggeration, but still uh, thousands and maybe hundreds of thousands of people who, for, for many reasons, some of them were just, you know, choosing between death and, and serving and some of them were well, ideologically driven against Bolsheviks. It was many, many reasons. And uh, this is a major difference between the contemporary Russian narrative about Second World War and the narrative of all the neighboring countries, even if, including Ukraine, including even, even Georgia and Armenia, Caucasus, South Caucasus nations. Because I've read their textbooks, and they now give the voice, give the floor to the those Armenians and Georgians and Ukrainians who fought in the German side, on the German side. And they, well, even if uh, continuing the, uh, the, to support the idea that, well, that was a good and the evil, that Nazi was an evil and the Soviet, uh, Soviet Union was on the good side on the war, like in Russia, Russia also does. But they also uh, give some reason in why people uh, get into the German army for the but not in Russia. I mean, the Russian official narrative is very strict. There are all traitors. There is no way to, to rehabilitate or even to, to give them the floor. And uh, I, I don't want to, you to, to think that uh, Russia, well, there, there is nothing on that side. Uh, literature is published in Russia. In Russia. Today's Russia is not the Soviet Union, and, and the literature which rehabilitate uh, on these pages, Vlasovites, is published. Mm -hmm. We had a two volume of uh, history of Russia to two, two very big volumes. Uh, History of Russia published several years ago. And the, edit, uh, the editor was Andrei Zubov from Gimov. Uh, and it was full of this. It, this was a history of Russia written from the point of view of anti Bolshevik forces, including Vlasovites and including NTS and all of that. But, uh, well, so it's, it's possible. There is no censorship on, on, on the general literature. But what I say, talking about, it's about the official uh, views in the schools, which we were promoted in school textbooks, in the, well, again, the monuments and all this official narrative. And this is very strict. And uh, of course there were uh, challenges to the narrative, to this official narrative. The challenges went from several directions. I would, uh, I would single out, uh, I, would, I would tell about three of the sources of this challenge. One is uh, international. I just mentioned that Ukraine, Georgia, and especially Baltics, Baltic states, Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia, and Central European states have a very different view, especially Baltic states in Central Europe, has a very different view on the Second World War as a whole. The predominant narrative there is the Second World War was a war between two evils. Like Nazis and communists were like the same uh, type of regimes, and they fought each other. So it's, and of course, uh, Central Europe and Baltics were just victims of two 
the two determinants. And, uh, and this interpretation uh, was also promoted on the official level. It was because it was in uh, European Council uh, decisions. It was uh, backed by Poland in politics. It was in the well, not only in the textbooks of the, those countries, but it also in some international arena. And that made uh, made a challenge for for the Russian government because. Uh, for Russian government, it is, it is impossible to accept this interpretation of the Second World War. Not because the uh, government is, uh, is bad or, or good, but just because it's, it's, uh, it's unacceptable for Russian people. I would not say that this 27 million of, of Soviet people who died during the Second World War died for, for an evil cause. It's very important for Russians understand, to understand that this uh, sacrifice was made for the right cause. And actually, we, are fight, we were fighting Nazis, we were fighting major evil. So, and this is, yeah, it's unacceptable for a general case. You can, and that's why, the, well, that's why the government is always in odds with these new interpretations. But for Estonians, for instance, it's unacceptable to say that the Soviets were at the good side because, well, uh, Estonians were split into groups. Uh, part of the Estonians fought with the Red Army and part of the Estonians fought with the German Army or with, with Germans and, well, to, for them to create a uh, comprehensive historical narrative of their own, it is important to, to portray Estonian nation as a victim and to, well, to empires as, a, as an evil empires. And that's a, a like objective situation when you cannot, there is no way out of, of them. There is one way, just not to politicize it, to leave the history to historians, I mean, not, not to make it an international issue, international issue because it's a dead end. So, uh, the other story was the Ukrainian, especially under the uh, President Yushchenko. President Yushchenko took uh, a lot of steps to, to change the Ukrainian historical narrative and to include, uh, to include, uh, well, not only Ukrainian Liberation Army, which was made before Yushchenko, also the part of the uh, pantheon of, of Ukrainian's uh, history, but also uh, to, well, to describe the Holodomor, this huge famine which. Uh, Millions of, of dead uh, people in the early cities described the Holodomor as a, as a genocide, which it implies that it was like Russian genocide against Ukrainians, which is again was kind of well, not only uh, not not just unacceptable, but it was strange from a Russian point of view because it was a uh, famine also in the south of Russia, in the in Don region and Volga region, and many people were like to 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 well, to, to describe it as a as a as a targeted against ethnic Ukrainians. And well, Russian historians and Russian government didn't, was disagree, disagreed with that. And that uh, went as far as to official exchange of letters between President, that time President Medvedev and President Yushchenko. It, it went as far as to international affairs. And the, uh, it was more important for a while than even gas, natural gas argument <laughs> between the countries. So this is a challenge from 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 abroad, and uh, the second challenge went from 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 within the Russia, because Russia is a big country, and there are many regions of, of Russia, and the regional hist histories are also is being being written right now and for, for uh, last decade, and the regional histories is different to some extent. Well, I just mentioned one, Krasnov, its most uh, visual, uh, the most most uh, striking uh, example, but only not only Krasnov. There were different stories for the regions we were, we were occupied by Germany and not occupied. And so the regions of the Far East. And some of the local historians claim now that, well, local historians in the Siberian Far East sometimes, in some instances, claim that this is not our wars. Our people were died there for not our cause. It is okay. But yeah. People died in Stalingrad, but what for? We are living in Vladivostok, very far, far, far from the end. Why our people? Yeah, that's it. Was a, of course, ethnic, different ethnic groups. North Caucasus had their own uh, problems because during the uh, Second World War, there was also the uh, forced and, uh, forced punishment of the whole people. And when the Stalin's were under Stalin decision, uh, Chechens, and Balkars, and uh, Kalmyks, and Volga Jomas were sent far well, to Siberia or to Kazakhstan to resettle. Uh, as a punishment. Some of the Germans were resettled even before the German uh, offensive and Kalmyks and uh, other 
uh, North Caucasus were resettled after that, actually, by closer to the end of the war as a punishment for their misbehavior. And of course, their, their view on the Second World War is different. And that's a, it's a challenge. And, well, there are also, also challenges for, for different uh, other aspects of the common history. So this is, this federalization of, of Russia may provide a challenge to the uh, central narrative. And it, actually, that was something that Putin just recently made, uh, made the theme of his uh, <coughs> presentation just early in February, months ago. He, he made another presentation claiming that we need to create the unified, the only textbook for all the uh, textbook of history for all Russian school children. And uh, now we have several different. Well, most of them are on the same way. There is no big difference. I mean, we do not have textbooks that uh, vindicate the loss of general uh, who fought in Germany. We do not have this kind of job. But there is uh, some slight difference. But uh, Putin said that we need uh, uh, only one unified. Yeah, and he uh, directly mentioned that we have uh, differences in the regional uh, histories and we need a control over the regional uh, well, writing of history. It's a, it's a huge, actually, uh, task. I don't know how, he would, how the state could, could settle that, how it would, well, despite, despite getting back to totalitarianism of, of, of Soviet time, because there is, a, yeah, Textbook by now is not only one source of information, and for for school children, uh, the internet became much more important. And for doing some homework, many many school children are relying on Wikipedia more than on, <laughs> than on textbooks. Or doing, that's and this is hard to control everything. So even even if they control the textbooks, it's hard to control all the all the sources of information. Which is this is a very big difference with the Soviet time. But attempts are made, continuously made, and this is a, uh, the position of the state. And the third uh, challenge to this uh, narrative uh, goes for the professional historians who are unhappy with creating any kind of standard of canon, 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 canon of, 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 histori uh, of historical events. There are, all the time, there are uh, historians of the Second World War, historians of the Soviet state, they always wanted to be free in their interpretations. And when, the, well, uh, when the state tries to interfere or to impose something uh, on, on their writings, it's, of course, it's uh, very unwelcome from the professional, uh, professional point of view. Unfortunately, uh, Russian historians do not have uh, any organization. Well, we have a lot of organizations on the field, like organization of historians of the Second World War, of the First World War, or historian, uh, historians of the United States. We have, I belong to one. Uh, but we do not have uh, the analog of the American Historical Association or, or organization of American historians. We do not have the big professional organization that would, that would probably uh, represent historians vis-a-vis -vis the state and to, to, to convince that some of the steps are ill-advised. Uh, Ill uh, but uh, still the historians has uh, some of the influence, I, I hope so, <laughs> at least. And uh, the, hist the story of the, uh, one of the, the, the most uh, striking attempt of the state to impose official point of view is probably the example where historians uh, prove they are that they write. It was a history of creating the commission to fight falsifications of history de determined sorry for my interest. Yeah, to detriment of, of Russian interests. It's an official long official title. The commission was created uh, three, three years ago, yeah, three years ago by that time President Medvedev and all the historians were just look it's a it's a commission to fight history. It's a commission to fight uh, uh, to fight professional historians. And, but most of the historians uh, the historians were pretty united, unified. Even <coughs> Academician Tishkov, who issued some controversial uh, letter uh, immediately after the commission was created, to, he wanted to gather a material about the, those who falsified the history. Very very soon needed to to explain himself that he did not mean meant what he wrote in this, his, his letter. No, it was, yeah, because, because the uh, reaction of the whole professional historians was pretty quite united. Everybody was uh, against that. And the commission actually got, got to nothing. It was, the head of the commission was that time 
head of presidential administration, Narishkin, who is now the head of state Duma. Uh, and, uh, but the commission came to nothing, and it was quietly dissolved uh, last winter, during the peak of the mass protest uh, against it. Against the falsification of, against the same, uh, for, of, of Duma elections. And uh, one of the <coughs> causes, one of the orders by President Medvedev at that time just listed many of the ukases which, which was made uh, obsolete, including the ukase of creation of the commission. It was, it was made very quietly, and, uh, and the commission does not exist anymore. So, uh, it's some, to some extent, the professional uh, historians can, well, if not convince, but just refuse to collaborate with this most, most uh, striking attempts by the state to, to, to impose. And uh, the reaction to this unified history textbook is also pretty much of opposition point of view. Even the most, uh, there was one textbook uh, published in 2007, which was, to much extent, was a response, response for that time uh, demand from the state. It was a, a textbook, uh, textbook written by uh, Danilo Filipov and Utkin. And out of those three people, Filipov is not a professional historian. Well, he had a his, history degree from undergraduate degree of Saratov history, but he never was a professor, I mean, he never worked as a, as a historian, never worked in the archives, he was mostly the propaganda branch of the government, and he is still there, and he was a major author of the history textbook. Uh, Danilov was a, well, it's a controversial figure, he is a doctor of historical sciences, he, and he, but he defended his both dissertation with history of communist party, and the <laughs> Soviet Union. Yes, and that, he was, <laughs> yeah, and he was, uh, he was influential until uh, recently, but there was a, another big uh, problem with his uh, his professional <coughs> credential uh, just just last month or two months ago, mm -hmm. because uh, it was a big discovery. It's a different story, but because Danilov was concerned, it, I will mention it. It was a big discovery of the fake dissertations in Russia just recently, and, yeah. and the whole you know uh, there's a whole dissertation council uh, created for like tens of dissertations which faked a uh, list of publications, uh, and, well, a lot of uh, and plagiarism, and probably people just bought you know, some ready to go text and, and defended the, the, the same. And the head of the dissertation council was Professor Danilov, who was also the <laughs> author of the text, school textbooks and was vice president. <laughs> and, well, and just recently, early in February, he was fired from, uh, from, from, from his job. And the dissertation council was dissolved, and so 11 uh, de degrees will be revoked by the Ministry of Education. So this is a, about this fight. So it's a pretty hot topic for Russians, for Russian historians especially, because it involves not only the state attempt to uh, to portray the Russian history in textbooks, but also it involves many of the uh, many of the side topics, but very important side topics, like in academic integrity in this, in this yeah. case. In this case. And I guess, well, I can talk more. I, probably it's better for me to, to answer questions, uh, because you have a lot of people. What do you think? We have 25 minutes before the end, so what? Yep. Uh, maybe we'll, we'll come to questions and answers. Thank I have two very quick, quick answers. Number one, the last one.